Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is February 24, 1980, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 54. Someday a few years from now, the survivors of Nuclear War I will start asking questions. They will look at the smoking remains of a devastated world and ask, how could this have happened? And why was it not prevented? Perhaps you are one of those unhappy survivors. This message will have been heard first early in 1980 by my listeners, but maybe you are not a 1980 listener. Maybe you found this tape in an attic in 1985 or in a basement in 1990, and perhaps you are playing it now out of curiosity with no idea of what I have to say. My friend, if you are listening to this message someday after Nuclear War I, I am speaking especially to you. Because unlike my listeners in 1980, you who are listening in 1985 or 1990 have the benefit of hindsight, a sense of history. You know that Nuclear War I really did take place. You know that it was more destructive than all the previous wars in history combined. And you also know something which I, speaking in early 1980, do not know. If you are a survivor of Nuclear War I as you listen to this tape, you know who won the war. Did Russia's new rulers achieve their goal of total victory? Or did America's new ruling circles, the Bolsheviks, succeed in their goal of nuclear stalemate with 350 million dead worldwide? As a survivor of the war, you will know the answer to that question. But you will still be asking all those questions about why and how it happened in the first place. My purpose in this message is to give you some of the answers, and in the process I'm also giving a warning to the few who are already willing to listen today in 1980. It has now been seven years since I first began going public with my confidential information about economic, political, and military plans. It all began with my non-fiction book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, published in 1973 by George Braziller in New York. In the book I showed how powerful people and organizations were planning to deliberately destroy the United States economy on the way to war. I described how inflation had been set in motion by divorcing the United States dollar from its gold backing, and I explained how this was intended to benefit the powerful few at the expense of all the rest of us. Today I'm sorry to say it's all happening before our very eyes. To the planners of it all, it is a giant game of numbers on a computer, but for all the rest of us it's a tragic human story repeated millions of times over. No one has to be told anymore that something is wrong. We can all feel it in the air. But our leaders are not telling us the truth, and so the people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I receive countless letters these days which express it all far better than I can. I'm about to read part of a letter I received recently from a wife and mother in my home state of West Virginia. It may sound familiar to you. I now quote, In my short 29 years of life the changes in economy seem so drastic as well as swift. My father, a foreman at a local oil refinery, now deceased, made $500 a month. We ate very well, and I was supplied with new school clothes come fall and spring of each year, plus comforts of many toys children longed for. We weren't rich, but middle class and comfortable. Now my husband and I make $1,500. We do not own a new car. We do not have credit cards, no charge accounts. Our one asset, our home, is quickly becoming smaller as our three children grow into adolescence. We live from one payday to the next and have had to ask for our parents' help in more than one crisis. I can hardly believe this is possible. In 1970, I had my first car and remember paying $0.27 to $0.29 cents per gallon. 
I constantly worry about my boys and how they will survive their grown-up years. My oldest son will be at the age for the draft in five short years, and I fear for his life. End of quotation from my listener's letter. My friends, things like these are the bottom line in what our own rulers here in America are doing to us. There's nothing accidental in all of this. If it were accidental, I would not have had the information to warn about it starting seven years ago, and our troubles now are only a pale shadow of things to come. The letter that I just read for you describes the beginning of the end of a way of life, the American way, and this month, February 1980, it has been symbolized by the beginning of the end of another tradition, the Olympic Games. Six weeks ago in early January, the puppetized Carter Administration began agitating for a boycott of the summer 1980 Olympics in Moscow. Supposedly the Olympic boycott would be to punish Russia for moving into Afghanistan two months ago, but in fact the Olympic boycott is only part of a much broader boycott campaign designed to goad Russia into war, and the very Olympic movement itself is now threatened as the first casualty of this United States campaign. The stated target in the anti-Olympic campaign by the White House is the Moscow Olympiad next summer, but already the maneuvering for war has whipped up gray clouds over the Winter Olympics at Lake Placid, New York. For the past two weeks Lake Placid has been the scene of Winter Olympiad No. 13, and bad luck has seemingly cast its shadow right from the start. First on February 9, the United States sired the atmosphere at the opening session of the International Olympic Committee in Lake Placid. The Committee was shocked and outraged by the speech delivered that evening by the United States Secretary of State. His only official function at the session was an honorary one, to declare the opening of the session, but he did not bother to do that nor did he waste one word on matters like good sportsmanship, brotherhood, or anything else that the Olympics were supposed to stand for. Instead, the entire speech was a tirade against Russia, demanding that the Summer Games be taken away from Moscow. The next day, February 10, an Aeroflot jetliner carrying 122 Russian athletes bound for Lake Placid landed at Kennedy Airport in New York, but the plane was denied ground service and had to fly on to Dulles Airport outside Washington. From here the Russian athletes had to make their way back north to Lake Placid by bus, and when they arrived they were given a taste of the latest in American Olympic hospitality. The Russians were herded into lodgings without adequate heat and with only one toilet for 18 rooms. As the games got underway in Lake Placid they did so in the shadow of an Olympic ultimatum to Russia by the United States. If Russia did not pull out of Afghanistan by February 20, then the United States would pull out of the Moscow Olympics. The deadline passed without a Russian withdrawal from Afghanistan, and the Olympic movement appears to be on its way to destruction. War talk is now swirling all around us. Like a giant whirlpool, it is spreading wider and wider, sucking in everything around it. The overthrown Bolsheviks from Russia who now control America will use anything and everything to achieve their goals. They care about nothing at all but war, revolution, and catching us all in their swirling hell of satanic power. As always, innocent victims are the key to Bolshevik designs. Today these innocent victims are countless Olympic athletes whose dreams of glory are drowning in the vortex of Bolshevik intrigue. Tomorrow. The Bolsheviks intend for the victims to be you and me by the millions, and it will not be just our dreams which are snuffed out, but our very lives, because human sacrifice on a grand scale is always a hallmark of Bolshevik schemes for power. Earlier this month our situation was summed up accurately by an anti-draft speaker to students at Berkeley, California. He said, quote, we all live in Guyana now." Unquote. The Bolsheviks here in America are shutting down our land 
as they prepare for nuclear war and Bolshevik dictatorship. The threat to revoke passports of athletes who want to go to the Moscow Olympics is only the beginning. Most Americans still do not understand what is happening, but the trap is already closing around us all. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, The Secret American Defeat of January 1980, Topic No. 2, Weather Modification as a Weapon of Retaliation, and Topic No. 3, Russia's Accelerating Preparations to Survive Nuclear War. Topic No. 1. Four days ago on February 20, the United States Olympic ultimatum against Russia expired. That day Pravda and the official Soviet news agency TASS said that the Politburo member Mikhail Suslov had given a speech at a town on the Volga River. The speech was actually a collective response by the Kremlin to American actions. The answer to the expiration of the Olympic ultimatum was, quote, the Soviet people will not be intimidated." Unquote. Then America was described as using Afghanistan as a pretext for blackmail and threats, and in answer to that Suslov said, quote, "...the American government's actions will inflict damage mainly to the United States itself." Unquote. The Russians plan to make these words come true, my friends. They plan to let the United States walk into one military trap after another. Each time they plan to let the Bolsheviks here in America believe they are springing a surprise, but each time the Russians intend to be one step ahead. Each time the Bolshevik Dragon shows a fang, the Russians intend to pull it. And so as Suslov put it a few days ago, the American government's actions will inflict damage mainly to the United States itself. The new Russian master strategy was already at work when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 53 last month. At that time I revealed that the Bolsheviks had already set in motion the August 1978 plan for a nuclear first strike against Russia. The secret planners of the American operation fully expected that the operation could lead to Nuclear War I before the end of January. But last month I reported that the secret American nuclear strike operation against Russia was already in deep trouble. First, the Israeli piloted American submersible aircraft in the White Sea and Caspian Sea were blasted out of existence on January 20. I was able to report that to you last month, and so I won't describe it all again now. The important thing to recall is that the Russians had lured the American subcraft into a trap where they were destroyed, and their destruction took place under conditions which prevented the Bolsheviks here from learning about it immediately. As a result, other parts of the American nuclear strike plan were still going ahead. When I recorded my AUDIO LETTER last month on January 21, I reported that American RPVs were being rushed to Sinkiang Province, Red China. An RPV is a remote control airplane and those which were on their way to China last month were very special. They were relatively small and hard to spot, very fast, and able to outmaneuver any known anti-aircraft missile. Like the subcraft, the RPVs were essential to the attack plan which I first revealed in August 1978. When I revealed the attack plan, I also explained how desperate America's ruling circles were to gain access to China's Sinkiang Province. This was a geographic key to the plan for using American RPVs to attack Russia's Cosmosphere installations in Siberia, but it took nearly a year and a half before China finally agreed to the plan. The breakthrough came during the urgent trip to China early last month by the United States Secretary of Defense. Right away we started hearing rumors in the news about a military alliance with Red China. Part of the price of the deal was for the United States to afford Red China most favored nation trade status immediately. And so, as his trip to China ended, the White House suddenly started leaning on Congress to act fast. By January 20, China was given a guarantee that it would be passed, and four days later our rubber stamp House and Senate 
approved most favored nation status for Red China by overwhelming margins. The Bolshevik war planners here in the United States did not wait for the actual vote. They were in a hurry. On January 21, the RPVs were on their way to China, as I reported last month. I can now report that they arrived in Sinkiang Province the same day I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 53, January 21. There were 14 RPVs. Seven were to be launched at Semipalatinsk, where Russia's Cosmospheres and Particle Beam weapons are assembled. The other seven were to be launched at Novosibirsk, where the operational Cosmosphere base is located and each RPV carried a multi-megaton hydrogen bomb with a cobalt jacket. In nuclear bombs lingo, they were extremely dirty bombs designed to blanket the target area with a deadly radiation for decades. But last month I reported that four separate Russian commando groups were poised on the border waiting for the RPVs. When they did arrive on January 21, the Russians waited only long enough to make sure all the RPVs were in place. Then around midnight that night the Russians began moving in. Just in case, there were also 45 Cosmospheres hovering over the area, but they were not needed. The Russian commandos achieved a complete surprise, and it was all over in a matter of minutes. The RPVs were all blown up, and the camp was overrun. In November 1978, a secret Russian missile base in Guyana, about which I had been warning publicly for four years, was destroyed. Joint American and Israeli commando forces took the base by storm and killed every single Russian on the base, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 40. The last month the Russians evened the score. Russian commandos wiped out the secret American RPV base in Xinjiang Province, China, and not one member of the joint American and Israeli forces at the base was spared. As the Chinese dawn broke over the smoldering ruins of the American RPV base, January 23 was working its way around the globe. That evening the latest replica for the late President Jimmy Carter was scheduled to be on television. It was to be a tough speech setting the stage for war itself to erupt within days. But the Bolshevik military planners here in America were in a state of upheaval. The RPV operation in China had turned into a disaster, so it was obvious that the Russians were now on the alert. The decision was made to freeze all other parts of their nuclear first strike operation to assess the situation. Coded signals were flashed to the non-existent subcraft in the white and Caspian Seas to continue holding at their final checkpoints. At the same time, another subcraft operation was getting underway in the Black Sea. Twenty-nine subcraft were involved, and all were ordered to stop in their tracks and await further orders. The Black Sea subcraft operation was not a part of the original plan, which I revealed a year and a half ago, but during that time Russia's Particle Beam Weapons Program has caused additional targets to be added to the Bolshevik First Strike Plan. Three of the most important new targets are at Kharkov, Voronezh, and Kazan, as I will explain in Topic No. 3. The first two were to be attacked from the Black Sea. The third target, Kazan, was to be approached from the Caspian by subcraft using the huge Volga River. When the Black Sea subcraft were ordered to halt on January 23, many were still close to their bases in northern Turkey. Eleven subcraft were ranged along Russia's Crimean sea coast, but the rest were still in Turkish waters. That presented the Russians with a slight dilemma. As I reported last month, the Russians preferred not to use their most important weapons right now where they can be observed in action. But it soon became clear to the Russians that the Bolsheviks were getting cold feet and would shortly order the subcraft back to their bases. Soon after night fell across the Black Sea on January 23, the Russian High Command gave the order to attack the subcraft. There were 92 Cosmospheres hovering over the Black Sea at that time. Each subcraft was being tracked continuously 
by at least three Cosmospheres using their psychoenergetic range-finding equipment, that is, PRF. When the attack order was given, selected Cosmospheres started firing their charged particle beam weapons downward into the sea far below them. Each subcraft was resting motionless a short distance underwater, not nearly deep enough to avoid destruction, and so each subcraft erupted briefly into a brilliant cloud of steam and debris. Then the sea was dark once again. Chance observers ashore and on ships saw nothing more than a brief intense light on a distant horizon, a spark that disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. But to the Bolshevik war planners here in America, those brief sparks on the horizon spelled disaster. They meant that all those nuclear-armed subcraft in the Black Sea would not be available for a second try later on, and the Bolsheviks then guessed correctly that the same was true of the subcraft in the White and Caspian Seas. The destruction of the subcraft in the Black Sea took place just after 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, January 23, 1980. A few short hours later the so-called Carter Doctrine was proclaimed in the State of the Union speech on television. For public consumption the United States was still talking tough, threatening to use military force in the Persian Gulf. But later that same evening, January 23, it was the Russians who were doing the really tough talking out of the public eye. Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin suddenly arrived at the State Department for an unexpected late-night meeting. There he met for an hour and a half with a top-level representative of the Bolsheviks. Dobrynin is famous for the beaming smile he always wears, but he stopped smiling as soon as the meeting began. Speaking with icy precision, he confirmed that Russia had destroyed the American subcraft and RPVs. He also called attention to an unpublicized disaster earlier that day near northern Greece in the Aegean Sea. A hush-hush oil rig, so-called, had been at work at, under Norwegian and American control using German and Dutch workers, but that day the rig had suddenly gone up in flames, killing everyone aboard. Dobrynin explained that Russia had known what the rig was up to and did not approve. It was preparing to plant nuclear missiles on the ocean floor to be aimed at the heart of Russia. The Russians had waited until the missiles were aboard the platform ready for planting. Then a trio of Cosmospheres overhead had destroyed platform, missiles, and the crew all at once. Finally. Dobrynin added something which was intended to drive home the hopelessness of the Bolshevik war plans. He revealed that Russia knew that there was one more element in the overall first strike plan which was still underway. A tiny force of four more subcraft were moving into the Baltic Sea armed with cobalt bombs. They were a suicide force, and they were all heading for a single target, Moscow. They were to approach Russia's Baltic Sea coast underwater until they arrived at widely separated points near Kaliningrad, Riga, and Leningrad. Then when the order came, the plan was for them to surface and make the transition to flight configuration. From there their mission called for them to take off, arming their Cobalt bombs for detonation on impact, flying their super-quiet subcraft at treetop height. Their mission called for them to get as close as possible to Moscow before being shot down. As each suicide subcraft crashed in flames, the Cobalt bomb it was carrying would detonate automatically. The Bolshevik war planners here in the United States did not expect that any of them would actually reach Moscow, but they were confident that they would get close enough to do the job. The ground-level detonation of four Cobalt bombs would send an enormous cloud of deadly radioactive fallout drifting eastward, and the Bolsheviks here were sure that Moscow, the nerve center of Russia, would not survive. By administering a giant dose of radioactive poison, the Bolsheviks were planning to turn Moscow into a giant Jones town of silent death. Dobrynin described it all during the meeting. 
Then he revealed that Russia was tracking all four suicide subcraft. He proved it by giving their locations. Then he said, I am instructed to inform you that you are now invited to attempt to save these four machines from destruction if you can. You may try to hide them or protect them in any way you choose. You will discover that you cannot. Promptly at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow, 12 hours from now, they will all cease to exist. The next day, January 24, the Russians made good their threat. One suicide subcraft was near the Russian Baltic coast itself, close to Kaliningrad. Another was well to the west, near the border between East Germany and Poland, where it strikes the coast. The third was far to the north, 30 miles west-northwest of Pori, Finland. And the fourth was clear outside the Baltic, about 70 miles north-northwest of Bergen, Norway. But all four were blasted simultaneously by the Cosmospheres hovering in the sky above them. The destruction of the suicide subcraft with their Cobalt bombs marked the end of the abortive first strike operation last month. It was a total defeat for the United States, while Russia did not receive so much as a scratch on the arm, and its ramifications are still spreading. For example, the debacle in Sinkiang Province was a major shock to China. It has revived the arguments within Chinese ruling circles that the United States is a paper tiger and the Chinese military commanders who were involved in the Sinkian affair are in deep trouble. In recent days, reports have begun reaching the West about a major reshuffle in the Chinese military. Russia plans to unseat all of the Bolshevik leaders of China. Meanwhile, my friends, only a few hours ago I received confirmed evidence about an urgent new development in Iran. The doctors at Tehran Hospital have announced within the past 12 hours that Ayatollah Khomeini will see no visitors until further notice, including religious and political leaders. The doctors say he has been overtaxed, but the real reason, my friends, is that within the past 48 hours Ayatollah Khomeini was assassinated and replaced by a double. It was the fourth attempt on his life, and this time it succeeded. He was shot above the left eye. Topic No. 2 A few nights ago on February 21, the CBS Evening News presented a sensational report. The report claimed that Israel had carried out its first atomic bomb test last fall. CBS alleged that the bomb had been exploded over the South Atlantic last September 22, 1979. It was also stated that nearby South Africa had assisted the Israelis in making the atomic test. It all sounded like a neat answer to the famous mystery of the giant double flash in that area several months ago. The mystery began last October 25, 1979. On that date, the United States released a statement through the State Department. The statement began by saying the United States had obtained, quote, an indication suggesting the possibility that a low-yield nuclear explosion occurred on September 22, unquote. Those are very uncertain words, but the rest of the statement was even more vague. For example, the location of the supposed explosion was narrowed down to, quote, an area of the Indian Ocean and South Atlantic, including portions of the Antarctic continent and the southern part of Africa." Unquote. That's an area of several million square miles. In addition, the United States Government admitted having no corroborating evidence about whatever had happened, and the announcement ended in the doubtful words, We are continuing to assess whether such an event took place. Many people were very disturbed by the fuzziness of the announcement. It was apparent that something spectacular had taken place near South Africa, possibly an atomic blast. But the United States was not sure what it was, or where it had happened, or even if it had really happened. 
Some people wondered, how could this be? We are constantly told that the United States can watch the world with early warning and spy satellites. We are led to believe that no one could fire a missile at us, even from a submarine at sea, without being caught in the act by our satellites. To make matters worse, reporters soon found out that the satellite which picked up the mysterious double flash was not an early warning or spy satellite. It is an aging relic launched a decade ago called a Vela Satellite. It is the die-hard last survivor of a series of monitoring satellites for the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty, and it was little more than luck that it happened to spot the mysterious double flash last fall. Had the double flash taken place out of range of the Vela, it would have gone completely undetected by the United States. Because the United States no longer has any spy or early warning satellites continuously orbiting the Earth. Russia finished shooting them down nearly two years ago, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 33 for April 1978. Ever since the United States announcement about the double flash late last October, the mystery about what happened has refused to go away. A panel of scientific consultants were convened by the White House early last November, but they have ended up with no conclusion. Then came the CBS report a few nights ago describing the alleged atom bomb test by Israel in the South Pacific. My friends, Israel does have the bomb, but the CBS story about a test was a lie. By the very next evening, February 22, CBS was already backing away from its Israeli A-bomb story. The truth is that there was a giant double flash in the South Atlantic last fall, but beyond that point you have been hearing nothing but lies and inaccurate guesses about the double flash mystery. The lies began with the Government announcement of October 25, which gave a falsified date and time for the incident, and since then the confusion has just kept on growing. My friends, I am now in a position to give you my report on the mystery of the so-called South African Double Flash. What happened there is something which you need to know about as a matter of survival. The brilliant flashes detected by the Vela satellite were produced by an experimental test, but what was tested was not an atomic bomb. The test was carried out not by Israel or South Africa, but by Russia, and what Russia learned from that test has just been put to use against the United States. The incredible series of storms which have recently devastated Southern California and Arizona were not natural, but man-made. The original State Department announcement of October 25 did not describe what the Vela satellite had seen. It simply said that it appeared to be an atomic test, but within a day or two word leaked out that it was a pair of blinding flashes, one right after the other. The first one was powerful, but the second was many times more powerful. For months now debate has been raging over whether this was the result of a nuclear explosion. The light produced by a nuclear blast behaves in a way that is similar to what the satellite detected last fall. That is, there is a bright flash, followed moments later by a second much brighter flash. So why the big mystery? Just this. Visible light is not the only radiation from an atomic blast. A nuclear explosion sends out floods of deadly gamma rays, X-rays, and neutrons. The Vela satellite is equipped to pick up all those things if they are present, but they were not present. There was a giant double flash of light only, no X-rays, no gamma rays, no neutrons, and afterward no radioactive fallout could be found anywhere in the world. Acoustic sensors on Earth confirmed that some kind of giant explosion had taken place, but the question remained. What kind of explosion? My friends, last month I reminded you of the giant air booms of two years ago 
off America's East Coast. For many weeks thousands of people from South Carolina to Connecticut and elsewhere were being frightened out of their wits by the booms. Public officials dreamed up all kinds of ridiculous cover stories to try to explain them away. Since that time the official cover stories about the booms have been proven to be nonsense by Cornell University scientists and others, but to our rulers the only thing that matters is that people forgot about the booms after a while. The real reason for those air booms two years ago was what I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 for December 1977. They were being produced by several newly deployed Russian hovering space platforms. These platforms, called Cosmospheres, constitute the third leg of Russia's secret space triad, and they were creating those giant air booms by defocused firing of their charged particle beam weapons into the atmosphere. In later AUDIO LETTERS I reported much more about the Cosmospheres, including their use in weather modification. But the Cosmospheres all by themselves have never been as effective in weather modification as desired by Russia. Russian scientists have been hard at work to devise more powerful techniques of weather warfare as a contingency weapon, and now they have succeeded in developing a newer and more powerful system for weather modification. Russia's newly operational weather war system involves two legs of their space triad working together. One leg consists of the Cosmospheres. The other leg is the Moon with its network of giant particle beam weapons. When I first reported on Russia's new Cosmospheres in AUDIO LETTER No. 29, I also reported on the first operational test of the Russian Moon bases. The particle beam weapons on the Moon are at least 100 times more powerful than those aboard the hovering Cosmospheres. When fired at the Earth, they can produce instant destruction over a wide area. So for their first test firing, they chose a target area where they thought the effects would go unnoticed by everyone else but their choice turned out to be a tragic one. In AUDIO LETTER No. 29 I described that test firing from the Moon at the Earth. The following is an emergency message to Dr. Beter's listeners. This AUDIO LETTER has been delayed because Dr. Beter suffered a heart attack before he could complete it. To avoid further delay, he has requested that the rest of his urgent message be sent to you in printed form. This will be done as quickly as possible within the next few days. You will receive a transcript of the remainder of Dr. Beter's speaking notes. We know that many of you are concerned with Dr. Beter's well-being and will want word of his progress, but we ask you to please resist the desire to call. Instead, we invite you to write any messages of encouragement to Dr. Beter's office. The address is Dr. Peter Beter. 1629 K Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20006. Bulletins about Dr. Beter's progress will be sent periodically to all active subscribers. If you are not a subscriber but wish to receive the next bulletin about Dr. Beter, please send a stamped, self-addressed envelope for that purpose. During the past seven years, Dr. Beter has been giving his life for us Americans. Now Dr. Beter and his family need our support. Let us all unite daily in prayer, and let us ask for Dr. Beter's total recovery and his ability to continue his mission to benefit us all. I will read the rest of Dr. Beter's newsletter. In AUDIO LETTER No. 29 I described that test firing from the moon at the Earth. There was a huge cyclone in the Bay of Bengal, south of India. It was a giant storm many hundreds of miles across, the perfect cover for a test firing, or so the Russians thought, but they made a small miscalculation as they chose their aiming point at the Earth. They knew that the particle beam would de be deflected by the Earth's electromagnetic field and tried to correct for it, 
but there was a small error in that correction, and as a result, the particle beam blasted the sea too close to the Indian coastline. In audio letter number 29, I quoted the words of an eyewitness who saw the results. She was a British relief worker who told the BBC, there were two enormous blinding flashes and the whole sky lit up as though on fire. Then this vast tidal wave, about 30 miles in length along the coast and 18 feet high, just bore down upon them. My friends, the double giant, the giant double flash, which I reported over two years ago in connection with the Indian cyclone disaster, had the same source as the giant double flash last fall in the South Atlantic. Both were caused by Russian particle beam weapons fired from the moon. When a target on Earth is to be fired at from the moon, a pair of beam weapons are fired in sequence, first one, then the other. That is what I reported to you in audio letter number 29 over two years ago. The first blast is largely dissipated in the atmosphere. In the process, it creates an ionized condition called a confinement channel through the air. Moments later, the second beam is fired at the same spot, and it follows the confinement channel right down to the Earth's surface. The target on the Earth's surface, even if it is the sea itself, explodes violently. And so a lunar particle beam attack creates a double flash. The first flash is somewhat diffused since it takes place mainly in the air but the second flash is more concentrated and intense. This, my friends, is, the, is what our tired old Vela satellite accidentally picked up last fall in the South Atlantic. When the government here made the first announcement about it on October 25, 1979, they lied about both its date and time. The official story is that the double flash took place about 3 a.m. in the early morning hours of September 22, 1979 but it actually took place on October 22, just three days before the October 25th announcement about it. October 22 was the same day that the former Shah of Iran arrived in New York City. On one hand, the Russians were maneuvering the Shah in hopes of undoing the Bolshevik Iran crisis strategy, as I have reported in audio letters 52 and 53. But at the same time, the Russians were also gearing up for hostilities in case their maneuvers with the Shah should fall apart. As a matter of interest, I can also report to you that the double flash took place around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, not 3 a.m. as claimed officially. The United States government falsified the time and date as a trap for the unwary, and many have fallen into that trap. The CBS fairy tale of February... February 21st about an Israeli A-bomb test is only one example. At the time of the initial public reports about the double flash last October, the Russian experiment in the South Atlantic was still in progress. It had begun on October 22, when two lunar particle beams were aimed at a location in the South Atlantic. The desired bullseye was at the navigational coordinates 35 degrees south, 26 degrees west. This point is on a par parallel with the lower tip of South Africa, but is slightly closer to South America than to Africa. Two of the Russian particle beam weapons on the moon zeroed in and prepared to fire. Meanwhile, a quadrangle of cosmospheres were ranged around the target area. The four cosmospheres were deployed at the corners of a square 800 miles on a side, concentrated on the bullseye at the sea. They were hovering at an altitude of 100 miles. It was expected that the moon bases would achieve much better accuracy this time than they had two years ago. But just to be safe, the cosmospheres were deployed well away from the target. Then the two moon weapons fired at the Earth. Firing from a quarter million miles away in space, the beams missed the center of the 800-mile target square by only a little over 10 miles. The resulting double flash was centered at roughly 34 degrees 54 minutes south, 26 degrees, 10 minutes west. Tremendous quantities of seawaters in the target zone flashed instantly into superheated steam. The hot water vapor and surrounding hot air started rising fast toward the stratosphere. Cooler air started racing into the target zone to fill the vacuum. The inward rushing winds began to swirl due to the Earth's rotation, and the barometric pressure began dropping in the target zone. Within minutes, the atmosphere above the target zone was a spiraling chimney of tumbling, rising air and water vapor. 
the world's first totally man-made storm cell was being born over the South Atlantic. The powerful beams fired from the moon had started the process. Then it was up to the quadrangle of cosmospheres to keep it going. The vast quantities of water vapor sent skyward by the blast began condensing rapidly in the cool upper air. Normally this would have led quickly to localized rain showers. As a result, most of the water would have rained right back into the sea, not far from the target area. But the four cosmospheres were there to prevent that. Right after the moon shots that produced the giant double flash, the cosmospheres went to work. Each began firing a powerful electron beam into the target zone in a defocused mode. The electrons mingled into the rising torrents of water vapor, giving a ne negative charge to the water droplets as they formed. This caused the tiny droplets to repel each other so that they could not condense into rain. So the water vapor was forced to stay aloft instead of raining back down into the sea. The cosmospheres remained on station for several more days in order to complete the experiment. They were able to confirm that the artificial storm clouds remained stable, drifting eastward with the winds. They also monitored the target zone itself to learn how fast conditions would return to normal. Then they finally dispersed. In early November 1979, the artificial storm cell was left to dissipate gradually of its own accord, and as a result it attracted no attention. Early last month, on January 4, 1980, the United States announced what amounts to a, cold, a new Cold War. A whole series of embargoes and restrictions against Russia were initiated. The most important of these was the embargo of 17 million metric tons of grain ordered by Russia. The grain embargo, my friends, is an effort by the Bolsheviks here to hit the Russians right where they live. Four days after it was announced, the grain embargo was described by a White House spokesman as the most punitive of all steps against Russia. And ever since then, the Bolsheviks here have been twisting arms worldwide to force other countries to do the same. Early this month, on February 6th, the Russians summed up their view of all this. Throughout the Soviet press that day, there were stories that the Carter administration wants to starve the Russian people. And since the Bolsheviks always used starvation as a tool of power, this was no idle comment by Russia. The very next day there began to be reports of strange developments in the weather of the southwestern United States. For example, northern New Mexico experienced a heavy snowstorm combined with thunder and lightning. But it was the following week on February 13th that the real weather news began. Unprecedented rainstorms began pounding Southern California and Arizona. Day after day they came, one incredible storm right after another. Dams filled and then began overflowing. Levees broke. Houses washed into canyons. Caskets floated away from the cemeteries. Mudslides caught several victims and buried them alive. Bridges washed out. Entire communities became flooded and marooned. Phoenix endured a flood so vast that another like it would not be expected for 500 years. And in the vital agricultural areas of Southern California, damage was mounting fast. On February 19th, the seventh day of the rains, a CBS Evening News report said, it's like an organized, organized assault, one storm after another. And an organized assault is exactly what it was, my friends centered at a point 576 miles west of San Diego, a quadrangle of Russian cosmospheres was in operation. Based on the results of their double flash experiment last fall, the Russians have refined their technique, and each time the moon bases fire at the Earth, they are becoming more accurate. So the quadrangle west of San Diego was only about 100 miles on a side and the cosmospheres were at the decreased altitude of 40 miles. Using the technique tested last October in the South Atlantic, the Russians were creating the storm cells one after another, and this time they did not just let the cells drift away to dis dissipate. Instead, they were drawn precisely to the areas to be attacked in Southern California and Arizona. Then the storms were triggered by additional cosmospheres hovering over those areas. 85 miles above above Yuma, Arizona, there were a pair of cosmospheres. Nearly a hundred miles to the north, another cosmosphere duo were hovering over the vicinity of Blythe, California. Both locations are on the Colorado River, 
bordering California's crucial Imperial Valley agricultural area. These Cosmosphere duos use their beam weapons to load the atmosphere with protons, which are positively charged. This attracted the artificial storm cells with their negatively charged clouds. That is why the storms pounded exactly the same areas time after time after time. And it was also the proton clouds that triggered the actual storms. They neutralized the electrons in the storm clouds, the water condensed into rain, and the devastating storms were the result. Finally, after nine days and over half a billion dollars in damage, the Russians called a halt to the storms for the moment. But this, my friends, is only a sample of what may lie ahead for food producing areas throughout the United States. While the western weather disaster was filling the headlines, the Russians were also testing out their weather control system in less dramatic ways all over the United States. A total of five more Cosmosphere quadrangles at sea and 15 more Cosmosphere duels over land were involved. The Russians are determined to retaliate in kind for the Bolshevik star starvation campaign against Russia. If the American Vol Bolsheviks keep to this food boycott against Russia, then American food shortages will be making headlights by this time next year. In the meantime, you still have a chance to stock up on storable foods. And, my friends, I would waste no time in doing just that. Topic number three. It has now been more than a year and a half since I first revealed America's shift to a first strike military stri strategy. Many of my listeners were shocked when I made this public. Never, they said, the United States would never strike first in a nuclear war. But how fast things change. A few days ago, on February 21st, Defense Department spokesman Thomas Ross gave a briefing to reporters. He said that if Russia should go beyond Afghanistan, it could lead to a nuclear confrontation. And he added that in that event, the United States might shoot first. Our Bolshevik rulers are determined to bring about nuclear war against Russia, no matter how suicidal it may be. But to do that, they have to have the support of you and me, the American people. And to keep our support, the Bolsheviks here are hiding the truth of our military situation from us. They build up our anger at Russia and then tell us how backward Russia is. They are conditioning us to believe that we will have to fight Russia and egging us on with lies that we can win. These stories we always hear about Russia's backwardness may comfort us now, but they will not help us when war comes. The difference between Russia and the United States is one of emphasis, not ability. We Americas, Americans have been living in luxury with all the comforts, but we are living in a fragile glass tower. By contrast, the Russian way of life is modest, but they are living in a powerful fortress. Soon the earth will tremble with the blows of nuclear war one, and it will not be the fortress but the glass tower that shatters and falls in ruins. We Americans may look down our noses at Russian consumer technology and feel smug, yet when it comes to military technology, the Russians have dealt the West many surprises over the years. For example, one day nearly 20 years ago, NATO and other observers were in Moscow to watch an aerial display on Aviation Day. Various Russian airplanes roared over, and the NATO observers tried to spot any new details they could detect, but they got more than they had bargained for. Suddenly, a big, sleek airplane thundered over, which was totally unknown in the West. It had swept, wing, swept back wings and two enormous engines on the tail. It was obviously a bomber, and it was also obvious that it was supersonic. The stunned NATO observers watched with mouths agape. The shock deepened as the first mystery plane was followed by nine more exactly like it. It was a highly advanced warplane. It was in quantity production, and it was a complete surprise to NATO. When they recovered from the shock, NATO aviation officials assigned the code name Blinder to the plane. If you're not a military specialist, you have probably never even heard of the blinder, much less the jarring surprise it gave to the West. But the supersonic blinder of two dec decades ago was produced by Russia's Tupolev Design Bureau, and you have heard a great deal about a more recent Tupolev supersonic bomber. It's called the Backfire. Now the Tupolev aircraft team in Russia is once again involved in a major military surprise.
In topic number one, I described the unsuccessful attempt last month to mount a nuclear first strike against Russia. The cities of Voronezh, Krakow, and Kazan were targeted because of the Tupolev plants located there. They are the temporary bases for an airport, airborne anti-ballistic missile or ABM system, which is about to become operational. The system is to be a last-ditch backup for the cosmospheres, which are hovering over our country. The cosmospheres are supposed to blast our ICBMs at the moment of launch, but in case a few should get through, the Russians plan to blast them during re-entry over Russia. The new Russian ABM system uses charged particle beam weapons carried by TU-144 supersonic transports. At a glance, the TU-144 looks similar to the Anglo-French Concorde, but the TU-144 is bigger, considerably faster, and radically different in some very important ways. Among other things, Russian civil transports are always designed with the option for military conversion built in, and the TU-144 is no exception. In June 1978, the TU-144s were suddenly removed from service by the Soviet airline Aeroflot without explanation. Western commentators crowed that they had turned out to be too expensive to fly, but they were actually returned to the Tupelo plants for military conversion to be outfitted with charged particle beams. This process is now nearing completion. Late last month, the TU-144 flying ABM system passed a major hurdle. It was tested against a missile with complete success. But the Russians encoded the data from the target missile, making it impossible for the United States to learn any details. Western analysts were able to tell that something happened to the missile in mid-flight, but nothing more. And so, my friends, we are heading for the moment of truth. The Russians are speeding up their preparations to survive the kamikaze war plans of the Bolsheviks now here in America. But for America, the countdown is underway toward the day of chastisement. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.